Hello and many thanks for being with me today. That's video one of our new UH-1 helicopter tutorial series. As you probably know, the UH-1 is one of the most famous helicopters in the world. Most of you will know the UE from many Vietnam movies, but this incredible aircraft is still in service all over the world. Today we start getting familiar with the cockpit basics. As there are flight controls and instruments, as well as electrical systems and radios. So let's get inside on the pilot seat for a closer look. To get a better understanding how the cockpit is designed, we refer first to the UH-1 flight manual, which you can find on your PC in English or German language under the following path. Please keep in mind, your installation folder may be at a different place or drive than standard. There are flight controls like the cyclic stick right in front of your seat, between your legs. The cyclic is used to control the main rotor, change the helicopter's direction of movement. Moving the stick in any direction will produce a corresponding movement of the helicopter. The collective pitch control or collective lever is located on the left side of the pilot's seat. The collective pitch control lever controls vertical flight. It changes the pitch angle of both main rotor blades equal and collectively, and as a result, the helicopter increases or decreases its total lift derived from the main rotor. The collective consists out of a grip type throttle and a switch box assembly located on the upper end of the collective. The single motorcyclic style twist grip is used to control engine power output. On its top end we find the box with some switches, they basically control the outside lights, light landing or search lights. Except one two-way switch in the lower left corner is used for fine-tuning the rotor and engine RPM at flight idle. The engine starter button is located at the bottom side of the switch box and from the pilot's perspective not visible. Pedals on the floor in front of the cyclic controlling the direction in which the aircraft's nose points out. Pushing a pedal will change the pitch of the tail rotor blades, resulting in directional control. In the overhead console you find most of the electrical systems. The rear part consists of several lines safeguards. The middle part contains switches such as collision and position lights, heater and windshield wipers, while the rotary switches on the pilot side controlling panel and instrument illumination. The front part to the right is essential for the startup, with switches for battery generators and electrical power modulators. We get a closer look at that in our next UH-1 tutorial, Quick Startup. So let's go to the instrument panel. The instrument panel is divided into five sections. The caution panel aligned horizontally right beneath the clear shield, the co-pilot side with his flight instruments, the control gauges for fuel, hydraulic and electrical systems pretty much in the middle and good readable for both pilots. The rotor and engine control column and to the right the pilot's flight instrument section. They positioned in columns dependent on their function. We start with the warning lights from left to right. There is the master caution light. His illumination alerts the pilot and co-pilot to check the caution panel for the specific fault condition. The RPM warning light provides the pilot with an immediate warning of a high or low rotor or engine RPM. The fire warning light to the right is illuminated by excessively heat in the engine compartment or by pressing the test switch on his left to check if it's functional before flight. We start with the instruments. Let's get a closer look at the pilot's instruments first. There is the airspeed indicator at the top left, indicating the speed of the aircraft regarding the surrounding air mass and is affected by wind. It's the only instrument showing forward speed, so there is nothing direct below. The turn and slip indicator at the lower edge of the panel indicates the direction of turn and rate of turn. To counteract any slip, keep the bar centered using the anti-torque pedals. 
In the middle column, we have the attitude indicator on top. Your primary instrument indication of aircraft pitch, roll and yaw in relation to an artificial horizon. No need under visual flight conditions where you refer to the actual horizon with your eyes. Beneath the attitude indicator, we find the radio compass indicator. When probably set before flight, the moving compass card displays the gyromagnetic compass heading. What this means is, it's gyro stabilized and it's pretty precise even during turns, acceleration or deceleration phases of the flight. It also has an automatic magnetic correction when enabled, calibrating itself automatically. But it's a slow process and not an alternative by the pilot setup in reference to the magnetic compass on the right side of the instrument panel. Two pointers are connected to navigation radios. Their use will be discussed in a later video. The course navigation indicator below is part of the radio navigation system, also discussed in a later video. The right column starts with the barometric attitude indicator. When correctly adjusted, he shows the height above main sea level or a specific point, usually an airfield that reports air pressure. In its lower left corner, a barometric pressure setting knob is provided to set a desired altimeter setting in inches of mercury. Below the altimeter is the vertical velocity or vertical speed indicator. He is indicating the rate of climb or descent in feet per minute. A small standard clock is the last instrument in that section. Essential for flying a helicopter under visual weather conditions are only the speed indicator and the vertical speed indicator. The engine monitoring part starts with the rotor and engine RPM dual tachometer. You can read the rotor RPM from the inner scale and the engine RPM from the outer scale. During the flight, both needles have to be aligned within the green sectors. Synchronization of the engine and rotor needles indicates normal operation. The first of three smaller gauges, labeled as torque, indicates the engine power output. The measuring point is at the gearbox and indicates torque in pounds per square inch of torque imposed upon the engine output shaft. Continuous overpowering leads usually to mechanical failure in the drive chain. The second instrument, labeled as gas producer, indicates the gas producer turbine speed, the first turbine section also called N1 in percent. This part shuffling air into the turbine engine. The third one, labeled with exhaust, also called EOT, exhaust outlet temperature, TOT, turbine outlet temperature, or T4, shows the temperature within the hot section of the turbine. In DCS, TOT restricted mainly the power output of the engine under any flying condition. In real life, the instrument is also essential during engine startup and under hot weather conditions. But under average ambient temperatures, not that much as power restriction, like the torque indicator. The single instrument right in the middle of the instrument panel is the radar altimeter, indicating the height above ground level. The last both column monitoring from above and left to right, fuel pressure and fuel quantity, engine oil pressure and engine oil temperature, transmission oil pressure and temperature. The lower ones to the left are load meters for main and standby generator, to the right the DC and AC voltmeters. The middle console between the pilot and co-pilot are arranged into two lines as well. Let's start with the left one downwards. The first radio, but not functional in DCS, is the transponder for radar identification and IFF indication friend or foe. The second one is the navigation radio for VOR navigation or ILS approaches. The radio below is the VHF radio mainly for communications with ground control stations, towers, radar and so on. The list belongs to the radio below which is the UHF radio for communication between different aircraft. 
The line of switches is part of the signal distribution panel and controls the electrical power supply to the radios. So you can cut off any radio from power supply independently. In that version of the UH-1, you can listen to any radio that is on and receiving simultaneously. But there is only one push to talk button for transmitting. The Rotary switch below, called Transmit Interphone Selector switch, determines which radio is the one transmitting when pressing the radio button. More about radios and communication in a later video. At the lower end are the weapon control panels, also discussed in a later video. The right line starts with a few switches. We start on the left with the chip detector switch. In the UE are two chip detectors, one of them in the main gearbox, the other one in the tailwater gearbox. But there is only one warning light for both. This switch helps to determine the pilot which chip causes the actual warning light. The switch with the red cover controls the cable cutter, used for emergency release of the hoist cable. The force trim switch enables or disables the trim system, controlled by a button on the cyclic stick. In DCS you determine the actual cyclic position as the center of your joystick, so you do not have to work against the spring trying to keep them centered. Located at the right is the hydraulic switch. It switches the hydraulic system on and off. In real life the hydraulic system assists the pilot by eliminating any force feedback on the cyclic and collective stick so the pilot can relax while operating the aircraft. Without hydraulic, the UH-1 is very hard to control, which is in its impact very well simulated in DCS. The lever with the yellow knob controls the defrost system and is not simulated. Let's go to the panel below, the caution lights panel. This subsystem of the master caution system consists at his left of two switches. We start again from above with the reset switch for the master caution and the low RPM warning light. The switch below changes the illumination level of the warning lights between bright and dim. To the right we have two lines of warning lights. Some of them illuminate during startup but before flight they have to be all off. Next is the engine control panel. The low RPM audio switch in the upper left corner enables or disables the low RPM audio warning tone, which operates in conjunction with the low RPM warning light. The yellow one with the red top is the fuel switch. When the switch is at on position, the fuel valve opens, the electrical boost pumps are energized and fuel flows to the engine. The lower line starts with the internal fuel transfer switches not implemented in DCS. Next is the engine de-ice switch. In the on position, bleed air is directed through the engine inlet to provide protection. The GOV or governor switch enables or disables the automatic control of engine and rotor RPM. The governor reduces pilot workload. He should be always in on position, except in an emergency, where more lift and engine power is needed and the pilot decides to exceed normal operation limits, aware of, pos of possible damage to the engine. Over the first radio in the right line, the ANARC-131, you usually talk to ground forces like vehicles or infantry. The instrument is also connected with the course deviation indicator, so you may navigate to and find the source of a radio signal. The next radio is the ANARNA3, ADF or Automatic Direction Finder, a navigation radio working with nav beacons on the ground. You got it. Closer discussed in another video. The last two panels, one with only one single button, are the counter measurements panels. Don't be surprised discussed in a later video. So we are finished and covered all the important things except for a few switches and lights. If you liked the video give us a like and if you are not registered for the channel yet this is your chance to do so. If you have any questions or comments please let me know in the comments below. Hope you come back to our next video a UH1 tutorial when we quick start up the UH1. Thanks for watching and always happy landings.